In this module, we're going to talk about reading and how we learn to read, how we have trouble with reading, like what is reading, and then the next module covers dyslexia. So um, we're going to talk about the physical aspects of reading, how our eyes move, uh, how people comprehend text, so discourse processing, and then how do we learn to read, and the next 15.2 covers uh, dyslexia, so problems with reading. So when we're reading, eye movements are not like a smooth scan, like a lighthouse um, light. Instead, they are sort of jumpy. Shwink, shwink, shwink. Okay. So a fixation is when our eye is focused on a piece in the text, and a saccade is when the eye um, moves. It sort of jumps from place to place. So we're going to talk a little bit about how fixations and saccades work in reading. So starting with fix fixations, they usually last a fifth of a second to a fourth, um, no, uh, no, 200 milliseconds, yes, a fifth to a fourth, a little math trouble today, um, and that's an average reader with an average level text. So we fixate more and longer for difficult material, so imagine reading a scientific article, which you should be doing for your lineage trace. Um, and so the the longer the words or the more difficult the concepts, the longer we fixate. And the processing window of what we're looking at is asymmetrical. So there are three or four characters to the left of fixation and then 10 to 15 to the right. And what that means is that um, what we're doing is we're looking ahead to what's next. And we're sort of, we keep a little bit of what we've already processed so we know where we're at. So when we jump, we jump to an area that we've already processed, but now we can look ahead. If you are in a language that reads right to left, you see the same window but reversed um, because uh, of the, the way the eyes have been trained to move. So asymmetrical windows even when the language is up and down or right to left. <clears throat> Saccades, on the other hand, are little, the little jumps. They're very fast, uh, less than 30 milliseconds. The average jump is about eight characters forward, and 85 to 90 percent of saccades are actually forward. Um, regressions are when you go back uh, in a text. So you'll see um, in like a difficult piece or in uh, things with lots of ambiguity, you'll go backwards more. Uh, people who are poor readers uh, jump backwards more because they're having to go back and reprocess. Um, and saccades really can predict how well you're going to comprehend a text. So the more you're moving forward at a faster pace, um, the more comprehension you see. And then the less you fixate, the more comprehension you see, unless we're talking about scanning. In scanning, you see less comprehension. <clears throat> you are actually blind during saccade because your eyes are moving. Uh, and the cool thing about that is that you can trick people. So you can get a sentence going. Um, the, um, the janitor cleaned the floor with the. And so they look at the word cleaned. And then you put um, the word lawnmower at the end. And people are like, lawnmower? What the heck? And they can go back to look at the verb. Um, the janitor mowed the grass. Um, and uh, what's happened is when their eyes jumped, you changed the words uh, sort of secretly. People get really confused um, because that's not what they thought they were processing. And they stare at the word mode for a really long time. <clears throat> so what controls how we move? The length of the next word um, in the sentence controls where we're going to fixate next. So if the next word is short, we tend to fixate after it. If the next word is long, we tend to fixate in the middle of it. So for languages that are incredibly dense, like things like Chinese and Japanese, especially um, uh, logographic languages, we uh, tend to fixate, do shorter jumps, because each character is so important. Um, so when do we move the eyes? And that's lexical access. So once you figure out what the word is and often what meaning to activate, when we talked about ambiguity in the last section, um, then your eyes will move on to the next piece. So it's sort of like, okay, got it, moving on. <clears throat> so people who are better readers have shorter fixations, make longer jumps, and jump backwards less. 
Um, and that's not, you can sort of train this, but it's not perfect. It's um, the more practice you have reading, the more you will do these sorts of things. <clears throat> So let's think now about how do we um, create a mental picture of what's going on in a text. So how are we processing discourse, remember, which is a, um, a paragraph or more of written text. Um, and then we'll get down into how do people process uh, propositions, the smaller pieces of text. <clears throat> so there's two ways that we understand text. Um, we're going to talk about the dual root model. So the dual root model is a model that explains um, dyslexia, understanding of text, and um, ways that people learn how to read, so it's super important. Um, and then we'll talk about the types of text that you can read. The situational model is another um, model of text understanding, and then lots about inferencing. <clears throat> so the two roots to comprehension. Um, so let's say we've got the word down here that we're reading, and the uh, ultimate outcome is comprehension. What the heck is going on? Uh, the first root is uh, the orthographic side. And so um, orthographics meaning this is the way the word looks. So I recognize the shape of the word. It's really good for high-frequency words, words that we see a lot, so we don't have to spend a lot of time sounding them out. That's the other root. Um, so things like have, because you have um, uh, irregular words like have, where it's gave, save, dave, wave, cave, have, do. So it's not have, it's have. Um, most people figure that out uh, pretty quickly because you get corrected when you mispronounce it. And so that tends to be the orthographic side. I know that this word is pronounced this way. This is what it look at looks like. It's a high frequency word. Moving on. Okay, so that's the orthographic side. Remember, orthographics is the way that it looks. <clears throat> the phonological root is the, um, the side, the sound of spelling rules. So I'm going to sound this word out. Um, it's good for unfamiliar words or words that are regular. So the sound, then the way that it looks is normally the way it's pronounced, like gave. Um, and that is uh, used a lot for words that we're unfamiliar with. <clears throat> So types of text. So texts have different purposes uh, and structures. So expository texts are factual. This is like your newspaper articles, your scientific readings, and their purpose is to inform or instruct. Um, and usually they have a very weak causal structure. So causal structure is the that you know A comes first, B comes second, therefore A caused B sort of structure. And the problem with expository text is that that causal structure is so important for comprehension and for sort of interestingness. So you tend to be very bored because it's just a list of all these facts. Who cares? How do they go together? So that's why your textbook can put you to sleep because it is an expository text. <clears throat> Narrative texts, on the other hand, tell a story. So this can be books that you read for fun. It can be online articles if they're explaining what happened. Um, and so it's anything that has like a sort of, uh, of a structure of related events. So that strong causal structure it tends to be more interesting. People like them better. <clears throat> All right. So how do we go from reading essentially which is um, the sound the the dual root model so I'm either sounding it out or I'm looking at the way it's spelled to the bigger picture model <clears throat> okay, and that's called the situational model which is a theory by Kench on how we um, go from words to meaning okay, so it's a model for comprehending text and so some terms, so the printed text is the actual words on the page or um, the sounds that you're hearing. So the surface level representation. I can process these words and I know what the words are and um, their individual meanings. <clears throat> the text base is the representation of that text in your mind. So you are hearing all these words and you're creating a picture of the situation. So what readers do is they elaborate on the text base to create the situational model. So situational model equals uh, text base plus background knowledge. Okay, so I've got my text base, all the words and my representation of the words, plus that background knowledge um, equals the situation. 
So uh, inferencing comes in as the process of bringing up the background knowledge. So the, the situation model is, is text-based plus background, but inferencing is the plus. It's the process of bringing in the appropriate background knowledge um, to the situation. <clears throat> So that background knowledge is the critical factor for comprehension. So if you are reading a biology textbook, that's why it's so Yonsville, is because, um, because you know, you're trying to learn the background knowledge. And since you don't already have it, um, comprehension can be, can be poor because you haven't had any, any um, interaction with it. So without a sufficient background knowledge, you can't necessarily form an accurate picture of what's going on. Um, and sometimes you can't form one at all. And this is when you get confused and you're like, ah, screw it. This would be like if you tried to read the fourth book in a book series because you don't have all that extra background. And so it will be very confusing. So inferencing, like I said, is an action. It's an active process where you fill in the missing information and make connections, so elaboration, to old information. So inferencing is really the way we fill in the holes by linking to long-term memory. This is a very active process. And we need inferencing to help us fill in the picture. So it creates, um, <clears throat> it creates the mental picture of the situation that's going on. Um, and if you think about reading your favorite knowledge, um, favorite knowledge, <laughs> your favorite book, having that background knowledge pulled in helps you create a, a richer um, experience. <clears throat> So we're going to talk about a couple types of inferences. <clears throat> so the first one is anaphoric. Um, this is sort of like anion and cations. Um, so a lot of biology references or chemistry references today. So we're going to refer back to known events. So anaphoric, going back. So Billy was working late. It was dark when he got home. So he is an ambiguous pronoun. And so it's going to go back to Billy. Uh, and this happens sometimes when you have um, ambiguous names that you're not sure if it's a boy or girl, like Aaron, unfortunately. <laughs> and so you can disambiguate by getting the he or the she. So anaphoric is back in a text. Usually, a lot of times with pronouns or that is, this is, that sort of thing. <clears throat> Cataphoric is forward. Cataphoric is much harder for people to process because it hasn't happened yet. And so you have to hold on to that representation um, until you hit the disambiguating region. Um, so I have this friend who likes shrimp jello. Billy is definitely an odd one. So Billy, going back to um, our, this friend, refers forward to Billy. <clears throat> Another type is an instrumental reference inference. So things that um, are actions or tools. So Billy shot the sheriff. The gun was still hot. Um, so I don't have to say he shot the sheriff with a gun. We understand that guns are things that do shooting. Um, so that makes it a tool, an action. A thematic inference is more complicated. Um, so this especially happens when you are flipping back and forth between um, different narrators in a text. So if you've ever read any Faulkner and you've been confused about what's going on, it's because these are harder inferences to get. Um, or uh, different flash forwards or flashbacks in a text where it's a different time. So you're connecting passages based on their common theme. So who's doing the talking, what's going on. <clears throat> and last but not least, there's causal inferences. <clears throat> causal inferences help us understand um, why things happened. So uh, A caused B sort of things. Uh, and they, they create that strong links in the text. And causal inferencing is the most important piece for coherency, given that you have the background knowledge. So inferencing is helping us pull in the appropriate background knowledge. So I said background knowledge is the most important, but if you don't have these causal links, you can't pull in the background knowledge. Um, and so I'm going to talk about several types of causal inferences. So all the ones after this one are, t are nested under causal. They're pieces for causal inferencing. <clears throat> So if it has a causal tie, um, we have a shorter reading time, and it's easier to recall that information later. So if you've read the Harry Potter series, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the inferencing around why characters do what they do, uh, especially the, the bad characters, um, and tends to make it better once you resolve all of those issues. 
um, versus in the middle of books where you're like, ah, oh, is he a good guy? Is he a bad guy? Ah, oh, he's Alan Rickman, so he's awesome, right? Talking about Snape. Um, <clears throat> and then um, causal inferences in narrative text comprehension, super important. So if you're telling a story and you don't tell people why, they don't like it. So if you've watched Lost, um, there's a great example of a narrative text with no causal ties. <laughs> right? It makes no sense half most of the time um, because it was meant to be confusing. <clears throat> so some types of inferences. There are physical laws. So uh, inferences based on sort of the way the world works, um, like things like fire. So if I say Billy's shoes were on fire and he poured water on them, you're like, to check, that makes sense. If you say Billy's shoes were on fire, he poured hamsters on them, people get very confused. They stare at the word hamsters for quite some time because that is um, breaks a physical law. Now, one thing to mention here is that in all of these causal ties, if you are reading, um, either, you know, things like fantasy or sci-fi or books that are based on other laws, if they don't explain them to you, it can be very confusing. And so that's why um, most people in those sorts of novels do world building. So they'll explain to you along the way that this is the way the world works in their book. <clears throat> So temporal cues are time orders. So um, Billy made a withdrawal from the bank, so he robbed it. And so he was in jail for a long time. So I have established the fact that he has to rob the bank first, and then he goes to jail, unless we're talking about minority report. <clears throat> Social norm cues are used as a way to um, establish what type of character you're talking about. So they, um, they're either part of social norms or they're the... the the rebellious teen. So Billy belched loudly in church and he was never married. That's a huge jump, right? But because you've made that first sentence, it makes sense. So he's he's um he's a terrible person. <clears throat> Goal related cues are um <clears throat> are cues that uh, get at motivation for an achieving an outcome. So these are all the soap opera cues. So Billy didn't buy the shoes, though, because they had to save the money for the trip. So we're trying to reserve money for something else, so we don't buy the thing now. Stereotypical behaviors um, are sort of like social norms, but also sort of stereotypical natural events. So it was getting late. Billy had to hurry home if he was going to be home by dawn. When you get to the word dawn, people stare at it for a while because getting late means dark. Getting late does not mean morning. Um, so there's sort of a, a stereotypical way that things are supposed to happen. <clears throat> okay, so all of those things together are ways that we inference. And inferencing, remember, is to create a situational model of, of, of a picture. So that's more discourse processing. The dual root model explains um, physical word reading. So what we're going to do now is talk about how people learn how to read. <clears throat> So learning to read uh, is sort of an interesting process because all cultures have um, a spoken language and so you learn to speak and you either um, uh, learn the language or make up your own language like pigeons. And so speaking is really common. Reading, not so much. Not all cultures learn to read uh, and lots of languages are actually not written. And learning to re read uh, is... Uh, a process where you have to have instruction. It just doesn't come naturally. You have to be taught to read. So we can study how people learn to read. So think about the way that you learn to read. Did you learn um, the sound of spelling rules, so sound it out, or did you learn how to recognize complete whole words? And most people are in the sound of spelling rules, especially if you sort of the hooked on phonics generation um, because phonics is one of the best ways to learn to read at the beginning. <laughs> so two roots to reading. You'll be unsurprised to learn that it's the same as before. So there's the orthographic route, <clears throat> um, where you uh, read whole words. So this is called the whole language approach or whole word approach. And it's learning language learning in context. So this works really great when you, um, especially when you encounter words that have um, many pronunciations, like read and read. So how do I know which one it is? And that's based on the words around it, the context. Um, it's also great for words that are, are pronounced um, 
uh, irregularly, like have. Um, and so it's really, it's useful in understanding um, ambiguous words. The phonemic route um, is when we're looking at, it's called a code-based approach. So we learn the sound spelling rules and look at breaking things down into their components. So phonics is the instruction of the letter sound correspondence. So this time, sometimes it's called the grapheme phoneme correspondence, or the GPC root, uh, where we learn grapheme written phoneme sound um, correspondence, so sound to spelling rules. <clears throat> Here's the problem. The relationship between letters and sounds is many to many. So this is called the many to many issue. So the same letter can make multiple sounds like pint and mint. And the same sounds can have lots of different spellings, fish, photo, cough, and puff. And so the, when you're thinking about how people learn how to read, you have to deal with the fact that phone uh, the phonemic root, uh, phonics, is not the best because of these issues. So you have to have both. Um, so that you can process words that have multiple spellings or have multiple sounds um, and be able to get there sort of no matter what. <clears throat> so what's good about the whole language approach? You don't have to deal with the many-to-many -many problems, so it's better for coding those irregular words or exception words like um, have, but it's really bad if you encounter a new word. It doesn't help because you don't have um, the picture for that word yet and so the, you sort of are stuck. <clears throat> the phonemic approach, um, it's really good for new words and sounding words out. And the problem is the reverse, the many-to-many -many issue. <clears throat> so which one is better? So I have phonics and I have orthographics, which one should I use? Well, research has shown that um, the phonics approach is a good start. So generally when kids are learning how to read, they have you sound it out and they give you a lot of um, a lot of simple words to sound out and as you slowly get older there's less and less sounding out and more reading in context. So we start by focusing on the the phonics route because it helps us understand um, uh, it helps us process and learn new words when we're gaining our word knowledge in grade school and then we'll slowly switch to context um, and the more you read the more you rely on context and so both of them are good and you sort of do both informally. So if a teacher is having a kid read aloud and they mispronounce a word, um, they'll correct them and say, well, in this case it's supposed to be read because we're talking about this particular thing. Um, so you see both of them happening, but direct instruction usually starts with phonics. 